I'm delighted to be here. Many thanks for inviting me. Today we're talking toxicity. And I think we're all happy to to we're all happy to realize that we are worried about iatrogenics and frail patients because they have cancer. Well, they might be even more vulnerable because of other comorbidities. The more complex the case, the tougher the management. So I'd like to talk to you about the the triad from hell venous thromboembolism, cancer, and chronic kidney disease. So very quickly, a reminder, cancer is an acquired hypercoagulable state. By definition, it's an incendiary situation. And so the risk of uh, thrombosis is, uh, is higher. Cancer patients are thrombophiles. And so heparin is uh, a weapon. And here again, heparin heterogeneity is such that uh, we need to make careful and suitable choices. What do we know? In the infinitesimally small, because I believe in biology, that's my background, we know that a tumor cell never acts alone by definition. It's like a mob. They're all gangsters. It's like the mafia. And uh, there's going to be an influence on the vascular compartment as well as other cells. Uh, so a tumor cell is going to try and ensure hypercoagulability because such a state can facilitate the development of the tumor. So this is a complex twofold reality, but the end result is the tumor wants to grow. So here's the concern. The patient is even more vulnerable. And if we want to block this hypercoagulability, it's going to be very, very tricky. So if you're thinking cancer, think, think risk. As I said, well, maybe I forgot to say it, but uh, the golden number for thrombosis is three. It's a 3D dimension, three different three different uh, problems, cancer, CKD, VTE, etc. This means that the level of hypercoagulability is, uh, is higher. And there's another triad from hell that is difficult to manage, uh, the association, the combination between cancer, uh, chronic kidney disease, and VTE. All three are going to influence the prognosis, and not in the right way. At the end of the day, irrespective of the loss you incur, the patient's going to hurt. So how do you block this? So if you're thinking triad, you're thinking Japan, you're thinking Japanese mafia, and let me tell you, it's, it's not a fun situation. So if we look at cancer patients, this is a, a Spanish registry. It's an international registry managed by a Spanish team. So if we look at an altered renal function during cancer, well, we're talking 45% of the patient population. So the kidneys are in poor shape in cancer patients. And we're going to make it worse. We're going to make the kidneys worse when we manage the tumor. As a result, the risk of bleeding and the risk of thrombosis is, is higher. Why? When you have CKD plus a bleeding risk, how come? Well, because we know that the platelets are like the paramedics. Whenever there's a breach of the endothelium, the platelets are the first on the scene. But when there's no anemia, the platelets make themselves scarce. And so in case of breach, the platelets uh, are activated very quickly. But in case of anemia, the flow is no longer, no, no longer axial in nature, which has a mechanism mechanistic impact and performance of the platelets is much worse. And uh, misery loves company. Cancer patients, the higher the renal impairment, the higher the thrombotic risk. A sick kidney, when filtration is disrupted, by definition, this will make intravascular pollution worse and uremic stress, oxidative stress will be worse. And this will tap into the hemostatic capacity, and this will create endothelial lesions and will lead to parietal hyper 
anticoagulability. So this is what we call a thromboragic syndrome in a patient who's already vulnerable because he has cancer. So difficult to manage. If we treat it using anticoagulants because we're thinking there's an increased thrombo, uh, thrombolytic risk, we find that uh, anti-vitamin Ks, because that is the gold standard, isn't it? Guy showed us that uh, anticoagulants have changed the deal entirely. Well, CKD is an independent factor which worsens the risk of bleeding, and the cancer itself does worsen the risk of bleeding. So again, a twofold worsening of the risk of bleeding. So from a iatrogenic point of view, this is very harmful. On the other hand, nephrologists know well that when you have CKD and you have and you're receiving AVKs, by definition, this is really a labile situation. You're very fragile and the risk of bleeding is major. Four to five times the usual risk when you have no renal impairment because the inactive metabolites of AVKs are no longer flushed out by the sick kidney, which means that the INR a therapeutic index, which has a yo-yo effect, and by definition, the patient suffers because very often he exceeds the uh, limits of the uh, desired the therapeutic bracket. So heparin, or rather heparins, that is the uh, first choice we have to both prevent or treat VTEs. But what is heparin? Heparin is a sugar, the length of which varies. So the longer the chain, when you have a particular sequence, the pentasaccharide sequence, which only 30% of chains have, well, these chains have an anti-thrombin and anti-2A uh, action. And when the chains are short, they have an impact, an antagonistic impact on factor 10A. But 70% of low molecular weight sugars have no anticoagulant impact, so maybe you want your money back because you're only getting percent 30 you're only getting 30 percent of active uh, ingredients so we know that these chains have other biological impacts uh, inf anti-inflammatory they have an impact on heparinases uh, endothelial enzymes they also have an impact on fibrinolysis and interaction between cells etc so they have other related effects that therapists are are much more interested about much more interested in these days, but that's a different story. If we look at low molecular weight heparin, this is a highly heterogeneous um, family. Some heparins are much bigger than others. As you can see, tinzaparin has the highest weight. The anti-10A, anti-2A uh, ratio, you can see it on the screen. It is the closest to the unfractionated FH. And this is really interesting. Now. Is it relevant clinically? The question is, if I'm dealing with a CKD patient, so he's fragile, the risk of VT, there's a risk of VTA in bleeding, so uh, the guy has cancer and thrombosis, do, should I go for AVKs or low molecular weight heparin? Have I lulled you to sleep? You guys look like you're in a coma. OK, as Guy said, it is twice as much as effective and it doesn't bleed as much so the cost benefit ratio goes in favor of low molecular weight heparin but if we look at ckd patients severe ckd is it in my interest to use uh, lmwh or unfractionated heparin we know that when creatinine clearance is too low then uh, lmwh is a counter indication but in this registry if we Look at severe CKD. There aren't that many, okay? It's a registry. But what's interesting here is that in terms of efficacy here, we're looking at the VTEs that are fatal after 15 days. Here, it's more effective in patients whose kidneys are healthy. But if the kidneys are very, very sick, LMWH is more effective. So 
unfractionated heparin. It's very long. It's been kidnapped. So what a waste of these uh, polysaccharide chains. And the, uh, and the effect is, is, is less. So what about the risk of bleeding? If I look at these patients, just because you see one sparrow doesn't mean that spring has sprung. So as you can see, there is no difference here in terms of major bleeding. But there is a difference which may appear to be more relevant here in terms of efficacy. And maybe that's something worth uh, exploring. So guidelines. LMWH is preferred over unfractionated heparin for the initial 5 to 10 days of anticoagulation. But what, what about CKD? We know that when the chain is long, it's a good thing. The longer, the better, they say. But uh, the short chains are flushed out by, by, the, by the kidney. But in case of CKD, there may be an accumulation, which means a iatrogenic risk. So Isabel Maé, a major thrombologist, well, a long time ago, she raised the following question. Actually, she, look, she looked at a cohort of patients, so 30 patients per group. They were particularly old, almost 90. And their kidneys were very much impaired. And so as a prophylaxis, she compared tinzaparin and, and enoxaparin. Only enoxaparin accumulates in the kidneys over eight days. Another French team looks at 30 patients and administers enoxaparin. But these are very old patients, very sick kidneys. And here again, there is a non-accumulation of tinzaparin. And so they hammered the nail home, 200 patients, treated them for a month. And as you can see, there's a perfect stability of this hypocoagulability induced by tinzaparin as a curative uh, strategy, there's only one major accident reported in a, in a patient who is particularly uh, fragile. So an anticoagulant is not like a, a drill, okay? It doesn't hold things up, but it does facilitate bleeding in case of comorbidities in patients who are already vulnerable. Now, what about enoxaparin as a curative? Now, there's a North American registry that shows that these doctors, pardon me, these patients aren't that old, but average age is 76 with moderately altered kidneys. So a curative treatment, and as you can see very quickly, in those patients who have CKD, the, the incidence of major bleeding is five times higher when the kidney is altered relative to a, a healthy kidney. Why? The long chains. The long chains are much more present in tinzaparin, 60% versus only 20% for, for enoxaparin. As a result, as a result, kidneys are everything. This is something that we've said for many years and nobody understands. So kidneys do play a fundamental role in terms of therapeutic management because the long chains cannot be flushed out by the kidney. So we know this caused bleeding. In this meta-analysis, we show that uh, there's a risk of bleeding in CKD if now I adjust the dose. If I adjust the anti-10A dose, not based on weight, but based on the anti-10A activity, we find the bleeding is reduced. That's the trend. The problem is when you put out the fire by covering it up with a lid, uh, chances are the fire is not going to burn uh, bright, but it's going to take a while before, the, before your food is cooked. Sorry for the cooking metaphor. So how do we manage VTEs? Again, those are not pro-hemorrhagic agents. So that's the idea. As you can see, there are many more questions on the table than answers. Everybody agrees that low molecular weight heparin is recommended for the initial treatment. Yes, it's pure heads or fight. But what about CKD patients, patients with comorbidities? Then. We wonder whether or not uh, low molecular weight heparin is the right choice. And also, what about the dose? Guy showed that, once again. In VTE risky patients, you need to increase the dose. And in these patients, the clinical benefit 
is there. And so we need to be brave enough to do it. But of course, the risk of bleeding must be brought under control. By definition, the risk of bleeding is higher than for non-cancer patients. So let's try and keep things simple. Say we want to evaluate. Does that mean I need to stop talking? OK. If we want to evaluate the the level of anti TNA activity, we have uh, information based on the peak, but not on the accumulation phenomenon. So the idea is to get values that are residual. We want residual value instead of looking at a signal that cannot be wielded, that cannot be usable, clinically speaking. So expert opinions. If you have a progressive cancer, thrombosis, and we try to bring it under control, having a residual level of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, once again, this has yet to be demonstrated and consolidated. As Once again, today, we want to answer these questions in our clinical practice. As my friend Jean-Claude was saying, in terms of cancer and thrombosis, uh, we need to pick the right choice. And of course, it's up to the therapist to make that choice, but you need the right information to make the right choice. So selecting a low molecular weight heparin is a good idea, but you need low weight, but also long chains. Because once again, we know that long chains are better for the patient. You want another mobster? Here he is, Vincent. You know Jean-Claude Van Damme? What's his motto? He says, stay aware. Now, this uh, this uh, task force has been set up as part of the CK network. The idea is to provide hands-on practical answers to these questions. And these are daily questions we ask ourselves. We as oncologists and thrombologists and physicians, once again, we want to organize groups of experts so we can better appreciate the therapeutic advances, but mostly set up clinical studies, the goal being to demonstrate that this choice is ethical and therapeutically sound for the patient because low molecular weight heparin means hypocoagulation, which is good in case of malignant proliferation. Thank you.